glad that uh, you're here tonight, and I want to thank you for uh, coming. I'm really excited about tonight's lesson. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about worry. Now, if you really want something to worry about, I'd encourage you to uh, do a 12-week series on anxiety. <laughs> it's like all you're thinking about is worrying, you know? And uh, so I catch myself all the time uh, wanting to worry. But tonight you have the notes with you. And so I encourage you to get out the notes. Those of you that are watching on uh, YouTube, we want to welcome you. We have quite a few that watch on YouTube, and we're so glad that you're joining us. I know one person wrote me from Australia. Uh, they're watching, so I uh, want to say hi to them. And uh, if you don't have the notes, uh, that means you're not on my email list, and I'd be happy to send you the notes, so you need to contact me, ron at empowerministry.org. That's ron at empowerministry.org, and I'll be happy to uh, send you the notes for this lesson and put you on the email list where you can get them before the class starts. So I uh, certainly am glad uh, that you're joining us tonight. Uh, tell others, will you? You know, we're in the fourth lesson here on this 12-week series. They can go back to the uh, YouTube page, Moraine Valley Church, and uh, watch the others. And uh, we want to thank Moraine Valley Church, by the way, for hosting this. Uh, they allow us to use this uh, wonderful auditorium and uh, allow us to uh, put, them, put us on their YouTube page. So we certainly want to thank, thank them for that. Well, we're going to start our series uh, on worry here. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about uh, the mind tricks that worry does. You see, there's two areas that affect us with, when it comes to worry. Uh, one is what they call the, the cortex, the thinking part of our brain. And that thinking part of our brain uh, causes us to worry a lot. And we're going to talk about that tonight. The other part uh, is the more the limpic part, the emotional part of our brain. And it works with the body. And although I'll mention that tonight, uh, we'll, be we'll be spending two or three weeks on what I call mind skills, techniques that we'll use to actually regulate emotional regulation, and it will regulate our body. It's hard to calm the mind down if the body's still going. And uh, likewise, it's hard sometimes to calm the body down if we're not doing the right kind of thinking. So they go hand in hand. Tonight, we want to spend time on the thinking part of worry, of worry. Worrying thoughts and behaviors, what can I do? You know, worry's a thief. Have you ever sat around and watched how much time it's stolen from you? I mean, at my age, we're talking about decades, you know. <laughs> well, if you added all the time that you spend worrying and feeling anxious, it robs us of so much joy. It robs us of so much time. And it's, it's, it's not just a thief, it's a liar, because half of what we worry about, 90% of what we worry about, isn't going to happen. And yet tonight, we're going to look at some of the things that happen in our mind that cause us to continue to worry. And hopefully, by knowing some of these things, we're going to be able to overcome them. Now, what I found out to be true is that when I try to work on these things, it's, it's like this, up and down but it's a little up and down. It's a little up and down. You see what I'm doing? It's, it's getting better, but don't think it's a straight like this because if we're going to conquer something like this, it's, it's going to be like this. But we're going to see that things that used to bother us maybe won't bother us as much and we'll be on to other things. But there's always something in our life, isn't there? Every day can open up something new that's a possibility for us to worry about. And so... Uh, we want to talk about that, but the trouble is a lot of times worry is not just a thief, it's a liar. It's not telling us the truth. It's telling us what we've come to believe is true, but that doesn't mean it's true. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And so it's not just the thief and a liar, it's a tyrant. It doesn't, it doesn't softly whisper. It yells, it screams. It demands our attention, and we fret, and we worry, and we go about trying to conquer these things. And the truth is, 
it never quits unless we make it. And so we need to know these things. It's not our friend. It's not our friend. And so tonight, you know, worrisome thought, you know, as far as the Bible talks about, it's been around since Adam and Eve. When they, when the fall of man came through Adam and Eve's sin, uh, they were naked and they were worried all of a sudden. They had to clothe themselves, their relationship with God they worried about. And so worry started back in the garden. And Jesus talks about our worry. If you look on page one, right in the middle there, he says, don't worry about these things. And he's been talking about what you eat and how you should clothe yourself. He's saying what we shall eat, what we shall drink, what we shall wear. These things dominate the thought of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he'll give you everything you need. Don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's open in prayer and ask God, who, who just said these things through Jesus, that he would speak to our heart and help us to know how do we tame this worry. So, Father, we come to you and we ask that you would open our minds and our hearts. Father, help us to hear these things tonight. Help us to learn these things and then help us to practice them. Uh, Lord, that we might be able to improve how we uh, do these things. Lord, that we may be able to conquer this tyrant of worry. And so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look to the middle of page one then and ask ourselves, what exactly is worry? Okay, what is worry? Now, worry is something we all do, but if we ever stop to think about what it really is, worry is a form of thinking about the future with apprehension and anxiety. So, you know, we're thinking about the future, whether it's five minutes from now, whether it's two weeks from now, whether it's a day from now, or five years from now. It could be 20 years from now. What am I going to do when I retire, right? I mean, but it's, it's worried, and it's thinking with apprehension and future. It, le it leads you uh, to uh, feel uneasy and overly concerned about situations. Now, sometimes it's specific, and, and you keep thinking about the same thing over and over. Other times, it's more like a pervasive chatter. It's, it's more like a, a feeling that there's a predator in a room, you know, this uneasy feeling, this bodily awareness that something's wrong, and you're not thinking about it. You've just got this worried vibe going on, if you will. Uh, sometimes that's due to like this constant stat static, what we call a noisy brain, uh, where things are just going uh, constantly, and, and, and it pressures us to, to manage these feelings. It causes us to sometimes want to escape, whether it's through some form of addiction. Uh, and so we, we want to numb ourselves sometimes, and we, we maybe not even know what the focus of that worry is, but it's become such a habit. It's become such a habit. Now, if we could slow it down and decipher that noise, we would see that sometimes it's a combination of feelings, thoughts, beliefs, and predictions. Feelings, a lot of times, things that are, you know, feelings, these sensations, because emotions are really start out as sensations. The root word of emotion means to move. It gets us to move. So it's really a bodily thing. It, it, it gets us then... It gets us, it activates us. And then sometimes, you know, this activation happens and we start thinking and we have these thoughts. And then, you know, these thoughts are based on these beliefs. So you have all these kind of things and these beliefs cause predictions. Now, we don't always stop. It's not like a sentence that we diagram, you know. We don't always stop and think about that. It's happening so fast. But it's good to know some of the parts where we can work on it. Sometimes, if we can be aware that it's a sensation that is causing us, we can use some of the techniques that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks and, you know, breathing, right, and slow it down. Sometimes that's enough. Sometimes, because some of these things, you know, are just going because they're bodily beliefs. For example, shame. Shame is a kind of about us, you know, it's not something, it's not guilt where I did something wrong. Shame is I am something wrong. And it's a deep bodily belief. 
And all it takes sometimes is a look from someone else or something said, and all of a sudden, man, our body just kind of takes over. And we have this sense of shame. And, and this shame then can drive us to worry. You know, what are they going to think? What am I going to do? What and all this stuff starts happening. Does that make sense? Is it making sense there? So a lot of times we can tell it in the body. Sometimes we start thinking. But if we can look at that, we can say, well, what am I thinking? What am I believing? And then ask myself, is it true? And if you can just focus on those three things sometimes, it can help us. What am I, what am I thinking right now? What am I really believing? Is it true? And if not, then what is the truth? And a lot of times that can stop us as well. But you know, worry for many of us is such a habit, we won't even get that far. And there's some reasons for that, and we'll look at them in a few minutes. The trouble is, it feels like we're doing something when we worry. It feels like we're solving something when we worry. But worrying doesn't solve anything. And so we want to kind of look at that, okay? The trouble is that worry becomes a well-worn neuronal pathway in our brain. And the brain does everything to conserve energy. And so as soon as it senses, boom, it, it starts worrying. It goes down that pathway. It, it assumes, it predicts. The brain is a predicting machine. And if we believe in our heart that X, Y, and Z is going to cause us trouble, then sure enough, the brain's going to do everything to keep us from X, Y, and Z, whatever it is. And we'll worry about it. We'll do all kinds of things. Now, Dr. Catherine Pittman and uh, Catherine Carl have written a book called Rewire Your Anxious Brain. And they talk about cognitive fusion. Cognitive means beliefs, knowledge, right? Thinking. Cognitive fusion. And that's where a thought, you know, where you have a thought and you assume it's reality. You have a thought and you assume it's reality. Uh, and so they have a short quiz here that we can look at here that kind of takes this, and it's, they're talking specifically about the kind of worrying that we do. And so they have here, if you have a tendency to take your thoughts and feelings at face value and believe them, this is likely to interfere with your ability to rewire your cortex to help you resist anxiety. That's why I say, ask yourself, what are you believing? You know, what are you thinking? What are you believing? Is it true? If we don't do that, then we're just assuming it's true, and that's what, he's, that's what they're talking about, okay? Now, the cortex, that part of the brain that does our thinking, and that has a great deal of flexibility, but you have to be willing to take advantage of it. To assess the tendencies toward cognitive fusion, take a moment and read through the statements. So let's look at these statements and just put a little check mark if you want there. Uh, to see if any of these things pertain to you. So you can work on these things. There's no shame in here. This isn't a, a pass-fail. There's no quiz. We want to know what to work on, right? It's very important. Um, if, if I don't worry, I'm afraid things will get worse. Now think about that one. If I don't worry, things are probably going to get worse. For a lot of us, that's an axiom. That's true. I mean, that's why I'm worrying in the first place. I don't want things to get worse. <clears throat> when a thought occurs to me, I find I need to take it seriously. Now, again, think about that. That's how we usually act, right? I mean, it's a thought. It came into my mind. It must be true. It must be. I have to take it seriously. But here's the point. We can't help what thoughts come in our mind. But we don't have to act on them. But the trouble is, if it comes in my mind, all of a sudden we start worrying. We start thinking about it. Here's another one. Anxiety is usually a clear sign that something is about to go wrong. I have to ask myself if I'm worrying about it. I must be assuming that something's going to go wrong. I'm trying to avert something, right? I'm trying to stop something. If I'm worrying about it, I must be thinking something is going to go wrong. Worrying about something can sometimes prevent bad things from happening. I have to 
to ask myself again, why am I worrying about it if I don't think something bad's going to happen? And I'm worrying about it to do what? To prevent it, right? So, I mean, a lot of times I'm taking that thought serious and all of a sudden I'm worrying about it. Here's one. I'm afraid of some of my thoughts. Now, that can be a very scary thing. I know I've had intrusive thoughts in the past, and intrusive thoughts are usually ones that do scare us. I'm afraid I'm going to do this, or I'm afraid I'm going to lose a job, or I'm afraid I'm going to, and it just goes down, 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 and, and we don't even want to think about it. So sometimes, you know, I'm afraid of some of my thoughts. Or when someone suggests a different way to see things, I have a hard time taking it seriously. Ask yourself, how tight do you hang on to that worry? I mean, when you're really worried about something, are you really comforted by other people? I mean, do you really listen to what they say, or is your mind made up? Is your mind already made up that there's something going on? How about this one? If I have doubts, there are usually good reasons for them. If I have doubts, there's usually good reasons for them. And how about the negative things I think about myself are probably true. The negative things I believe about myself are probably true. How many times does our worry give us those negative things that we're thinking about ourselves? And when I expect to do poorly, it usually means I will do poorly. You ever have test anxiety? You know, boy, I don't know if I'm going to do it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. I don't know if I can do this. And we start worrying about it and worrying about it, and it causes issues. So most of us, if we're really full of worry a lot of times, the chances are we probably checked a lot of these statements as true. And that's nothing to, to, to be overly concerned about. All it means is that we need to take a look at some of the things we're thinking because we're assuming just because we think them that they're true. And, and the good news is we have the right, <laughs> we have the right to challenge these things. We have a, the right to challenge our worry. Okay? So what are some of the things that we can worry about? Well, here's a list on page two. Uh, doing well at work, paying our bills on time, being accepted by others, meeting someone in public. Take a look at that list for a minute our family safety, and just kind of maybe put a little check mark near some of the ones that maybe you could get concerned about. Take a minute and do that. And perhaps that's jogging your memory a little bit. And each one of them can have all kinds of branches, right, that, that come off them. For example, the last one's money, right? And there can be all kinds of associate worries. So in money, you can, you know, worry about not getting paid or, or uh, someone stealing your money or, uh, f you know, falling from some kind of fraud out there on a telemarketer thing or, you know, not having enough to meet your needs making poor spending choices. So you have that list there. Just on the next page, on page three there, why don't you write down, I had five things or ten things. Why don't you just write down maybe two or three things that, that would be high on your worry list, okay? And then when you do that, if you feel comfortable at the table, 
why don't you go ahead and just uh, maybe share one, something that you're comfortable with, with the people at the table, and just say, you know, I worry about this a little bit, and you can listen to theirs, and, and know, uh, hopefully you'll know that you're not the only one worrying. But if you don't want to say anything, you just say pass if you need to, or just don't say. But anyways, I want you to take a minute and think of uh, maybe a couple things and write them down there uh, that you worry about. Those of you that are watching at home, you can take a moment to do that as well and just uh, write down some of the things that you worry about. When you're done, go ahead and take a minute and share at the table, just maybe one of them, okay? Those of you that are watching on YouTube, maybe there's someone there watching it with you. You can share with them. Maybe you just take a moment of, you know, some kind of uh, reflection right now. Take a moment and uh, just go ahead and, you know, expand on your list. Ask yourself, why am I worrying about this? The rest of you can just share at the table. Just give us another minute now. All right, let's take about one more minute. Okay, one more minute. Let's look at the million dollar question here, if you're with me on the middle of page three. What does worry really solve? Now there's a difference between worry and problem solving. 
problem solving is, uh, for example, if you're a manager at work, right, there's a problem comes up, you're called on to help solve that problem. I mean, uh, you know, I used to come home and tell Janine I was putting out fires all day long. <laughs> now, there's a difference between problem solving and just worrying, right? And so what does worrying really solve? Now, experts suggest that anywhere between 85 and 95% of what we worry about never happens. Now, if that's true, then why do we worry? Now, when I was in the constant anxiety and overrunning anxiety, I couldn't always put my finger necessarily on what I was worrying about. But every once in a while, I'd, I'd start worrying about, you know, uh, is something going to happen to me? Something is wrong and all this catastrophic kind of thinking. And so I would use some techniques I learned on how to stop that kind of stuff, how to put it off. And what I found is a lot of times I would say, you know, I'm not going to, you know, Monday is going to be my worry day. I'm going to put it in my, you know, so if it's like Wednesday, you know, if it's really that important, I'm going to worry about it Monday. And I'll write it down, I'll put it in a worry box, right? And what I found out as, as I would practice this, that a lot of times I'd just go to the box I'd, and throw them away because they weren't concerns anymore. If I was able to stop worrying about it, and, and, and I knew myself well enough, I took these things serious enough, and I made a vow to God, Lord, I promise if they're that important, I'll get to them, I'll look at them. But what I found is a couple of days later, when it was time to really look at them, they were either solved, minimized, wasn't, I was on to something else. <laughs> they weren't that important. And, and you might want to try that. That a lot of times what we do is just this combination of stuff that makes it so, so hard to stop sometimes. Now, part of the reason is that our behavior reinforces the worried mind and, and makes it feel legitimate. And every time we work, now here's, here's the key, every time we work towards solving worry, we non-willingly say, I agree, there's something legitimate here. There must be something legitimate about this because I'm working trying to solve it. I agree, there's something here to worry about. So let's look at different things we do with worry and then discover if we can maybe tame this, what I call worry brain, okay, that keeps us going in circles. So worry creating thoughts. Now, thinking is behind a lot of worrying we do, and when we analyze worry, we can put most of the kinds of thinking thoughts into different categories, and here's some. You can look, and you may want to check off some and come back to them uh, later. One is focusing on the negative, and you got to ask yourself, am I an optimist or a pessimist? Am I somewhere in between? You know, is that proverbial glass half full or half empty? And a lot of us have that half-empty kind of outlook. And, and, and the point is, it doesn't have to stay that way. It doesn't have to stay that way. And a lot of times we get a pessimistic outlook, and the good news is we can change. We can learn optimism. The same person, uh, Martin Sigelman, that created uh, Learned Helplessness, the theory on depression, later, years later, came up with Learned Optimism. The fact that we can learn to be more optimistic, we can learn. It, it, you know, being a pessimist was a learned behavior. We learned it somewhere, and we can relearn. And that's where we get into emotional relearning as we go through our class. And so, you know, are we focusing on the negative? Other ones, should statements. This is a common anxiety trap. It comes out of the attitude that I need to be in control. And that's okay you know, with, with things that you can control, uh, but there are many things we can't control. It also emphasizes the feelings that I'm not good enough. You know, we can't control what other people do a lot of times. We can try, but we can spend a lot of times trying to control others, trying to control others, and it, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so we go around with should, should comments. I was working with a, a young lady not too long ago, and within a 30-minute period as we were talking, she must have said I should have done something at least six or seven times. And, and all this should, right? And so, you know, um, 
you know, I should have done better. They should have picked on, should not have picked on me, or they should have picked me, I should say. I should not cry. You know, I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't have done that. I should have never did that. They should have never, you know, and so we have all these shoulds. Another one on page four is over, over generalization. You know, words like always and never. And you'll be, you'll be amazed uh, in, in marriage counseling how many times we tell couples to, to stay away from words like always and never. And you'll be surprised as you start listening. Well, he always does this. She never does that. Or, you know, and, and you'd be surprised how many times when we talk, it's an always or it's a never, and we overgeneralize. And we need to pull it back. Anything that seems like exaggeration or doesn't allow for exceptions, I never do anything right. I'm always last to be picked for games. Nobody likes me. Now, sometimes these are based on sort of true things, but it doesn't have to define us. For example, you may be uh, not that good in sports, and it may be that a lot of times you get picked last in games, and that happens to kids. But that doesn't mean you're not good at anything, you know. And so we need to watch out for the exaggeration in that case. It doesn't define us. All or nothing, black or white, right? And this extreme type, type of thinking, there's little room for exceptions. This is the result of making a judgment based on some of the facts. It's an overgeneralization. And I find that a lot of times I use that kind of thinking just because I don't want to stop worrying. That's the kind of thing I tell someone when they challenge me. If they challenge me and I worry, then I go right to the, you know, all or nothing, you know. Well, I have to do this. I'm sorry. And, I, and I, you know, you become militant. You know, things like this. If I fail my test, my life is over. You know, oh, I ate that candy. My diet is foiled. No sense trying, right? And we can do all this all or nothing. You know, every boss treats me horrible. And you'll be amazed at how many of these things we have if we're honest with ourselves. We just don't stop to think about them. When we start to worry, these thoughts, they, they don't make whole sentences. Our brain fills in the gap. Our brain fills in the gap. And so all we have to do is just start, and all of a sudden there, everyone's picking on me. Nobody loves me. You know, we don't, we don't think in whole sentences, but it's there nevertheless. And sometimes we need to slow it down and ask ourselves, what am I thinking? What's behind this worry? What am I believing here? Catastrophic thinking. It's the kind of thinking that always goes to a dark place. It's thinking the worst. It's, it's a what-if kind of conclusion. My head is hurt all day. I might have a brain tumor. Now, that sounds, you know, maybe ridiculous, but a lot of people kind of go to those extremes, right? I shouldn't have said that. Now she hates me. And, uh, you know, they left the party without saying bye. What if I never see them again? And you'll be surprised how much of our thinking is so, you know, you know, you need to ask yourself or, or non-substantiated assumptions. Uh, uh, this is like mind reading. When we, when we believe we know what someone else is thinking, for example, right? I know that Mary was angry with me and she'll never talk to me again. Now I'm all worried. Well, who said? Who said? And even in marriage counseling, sometimes when we're working with couples, right, someone will say something. Now, you know, husband will say something about the wife. Now, turn us, well, hang on. Is that true? Is that what you were thinking? And you'd be surprised how many times, no, that's not what I was thinking. You know, we tend to mind read. We tend to, to overgeneralize uh, or have non-substantiated assumptions. And we need to ask ourselves, you know, is it true? What are we believing? Can I really substantiate this. And then there's irrational beliefs. Many kind of uh, thinking would fall under that category. Anything under scrutiny that seems to be exaggerated or extreme, you know, or doesn't make sense would fit there. You know, I have so many issues, I might as well give up. I might as well give up. It's, there's no use. I'm worthless. 
I'm so dumb, I will never figure this out. I'm the most unappealing, horrible looking slob in the world. You'd be amazed at how many things we think like this. And a lot of us go to that extreme kind of thinking. Now, sometimes it's an excuse because then we don't have to do anything, right? I mean, if it's bad enough, no sense working on it, right? And that's exactly what happens. We make it bad enough, all we do is worry about it. We let it move us. We let it, you know, emo we start emoting, but we don't do anything. On page five, we have the worry thinking behavior. This is probably one of the most prevalent forms of worry, right? We tend to think if we just do something, then the problem is solved. But when it isn't a problem, but only worries over a situation, then it's never solved. And that's important. If it's, you know, that's important because we just keep thinking. A person feels that someone is going to break into their house, right? They already have the right kind of locks, but there's never been a break-in before. So every day they worry about it. Days turn into weeks and months, nothing ever happens. But meanwhile, they do all sorts of things to make sure that they're not bothered by an intrusion. All they did is perpetuate the same worry over and over again. Our behavior, you see, when we have this worry-thinking behavior, it, it continues to propagate that, we're, that there must be something that we need to worry about. So we put five locks on the door instead of two. And you would think that would stop our worrying, but it doesn't. Because our behavior is just substantiating it. And I'll get into it in a few minutes, but I'll jump to it right now for a moment. A lot of this is based on the fact that we we worry about things because we assume they're going to happen. We think about possibility versus probabilities. Is there a probability someone could break in your house? Perhaps. But it's probable it's not going to happen. You have the lights on. You got the doors locked. It's a safe neighborhood. The police are around, right? The probability is low. Is it possible? There's always a possibility. You never win when you go down possibilities. And, we're, and unfortunately, we're in a society that looks at possibilities all the time. And, and, and so we're trying to, uh, you know, prepare ourselves for everything. Because it's a possibility. And we need to stop this possibility thinking and need to bring faith into it. And look at probability and start trusting the Lord and prepare. But we're prepared enough for these things. And so a lot of times we're, we're looking at that, and we need, to, we need to look a little co closer. And so what we do a lot of times is we do this stuff that we call, you know, what we call playing it safe. And this playing it safe behavior continues to perpetuate our worry. And let's look at some of these things, okay? And here again, some of these things you're going to ask, probably say, well, what's wrong with that? That's my standard operating, um, you know, system. But the fact is this safe behavior a lot of times continues the worry. So the first one, we keep seeking information. If I just keep searching, someone will have the correct answer. Uh, this is, you know, that paralysis of analysis. We keep fact-checking, looking for the best way to solve something, and we're never finished, right? And if someone tells us to worry, we'll always find someone else that would tell us to worry about it. Because there's always someone out there that's going to tell us how horrible it is and how possible it is. And if we're looking for it, we'll find it. It wouldn't take long for any of us in here to believe that we have some horrible disease if we read the right thing. If we had a certain symptom and then we just keep searching and searching and searching, we'll find the right article out there. We'll find someone that will agree with us. But all that does is continue the worry or procrastination. I'm not ready yet. Just a little more time. 
We keep putting off finishing something because we're never be sure whether it's good enough. And all that does is perpetuate the worry. Am I going to fail? Am I going to do this? And I never, I never get out there. And some of that's what we talk about in our other class about a, a, a set mindset where we're afraid. You know, we're good at something here. and We don't want to branch out. We don't have this growth mindset. We need to learn that it's okay to fail. That growth is a good thing. And that we need to not worry about some of these things. But we've got this built-in worry because we're worried about what people will think about us, what the result will be, and, and we get fearful, don't we? Well, here's another one that's similar to seeking information. We check and keep checking. Did we lock all the doors? Did we make the appointment? Do I have a temperature? <laughs> Right? Checking up over and over doesn't solve anything. It only tells our worry brain that this is right to be concerned about the problem at hand. They call this a monkey mind, you know? It comes from a monkey chatter. You ever listen to monkey? Wah, 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 all that chattering, and that's what they call this. It's nothing but chatter and chatter, and it just keeps going. The monkey brain, right? And it never stops. And this kind of stuff, this is like giving a monkey a banana. Right? It just keeps, keeps the monkey going. And so uh, we make a list. Now, I'm a list person. I make a list. But then do we make a list of our lists? You know, do we keep going? Do we keep making lists? Is that just another form of telling ourselves this is something I must really be worried about? Again, it comes back to the question. When we start doing this stuff, it's because we've already believed in our mind this is something we must be worried about. And we never get to the question, is it true? What's the probability? Do I really need to be worrying about this? What am I believing? We never get to that because we're doing all of this. We've already assumed it needs all of our attention. Is this, is this making sense? Do you see where we're going here with this? This kind of stuff perpetuates it. Playing it safe. I must be careful. I need good boundaries to keep me safe. Safeguards, staying within limits, doesn't take care of anything. It stunts our maturity, our abilities. Playing it safe leaves no room for growth. It doesn't allow for learning from mistakes or stretching ourselves in order to reach a much higher goal. It limits us and what, uh, and what God and others could do if, if they were only allowed to help us, right? Another one, I must be 100% correct. In order to feel good, I must keep checking, researching, trying over and over so I can be 100% certain. The trouble is we can never be 100% certain. Instead, we need to know that things are good enough. We need to put it in that worry drawer, that worry box, and, and put it till Monday or whenever you're going to do it. Or explaining myself. I must make sure that people have the correct opinion of me. When I finally get the courage to step out and express myself, give an idea, give something a try, before I do, I preface it with an explanation of why it may not work or why I'm doing this in this particular way. It may be that I end up giving excuses afterwards. I mean, have you ever done that? I know I have. And that's just another form of worrying about ourselves. I'm not good enough. And see, that's why a lot of times it's predicated on what I'm believing. I must be perfect or no one will like me. I must look this certain way or people will ridicule me. I can't, you know, people can't ridicule me or I'll die. Everyone was like me. You see, all these kinds of things that we, we take as truth and we need to challenge some of these things. Or repeating, to make sure I need to do whatever I think will work in this situation over and over again. And this obsession is not helping anything. It only wastes time and perpetuates the worry. Avoidance. Avoidance is an easy one, right? If I just avoid it, it will go away. <laughs> avoid initiating conversations. Annoyed, avoid taking time for yourself. Avoid calling someone. Perhaps your problem would go away if it was a real problem. But if we don't face the worry and get rid of it, 
it will keep coming up. On page six, we got keep going, keep going over what was done or said over and over again. And a lot of these are similar, I know, but I'm trying to get the point across. If we can only find a fatal flaw, I can fix everything. The trouble is there's no fatal flaw. And even if there was, we've just legitimized the worry and we'll find some way to discount what was just discovered. It will never be enough. It will never be enough. There must be a second fatal flaw, you see. Or we constantly seek other people's assurance. If I can just find someone I can believe and they can explain why everything will be okay, then I won't worry. But you know what? You'll find something wrong with what they said. You'll find some reason to go out and find another expert that's what worry does. That's what worry does. Worry causes us to just keep checking and keep checking. Sometimes we take, we take on too much responsibility because if we can just do enough, then, you know, we can avoid all these things we worry about. And uh, being a workaholic or a people pleaser, we'll do all kinds of things to keep from having people upset at us. Why? Because our worry is if someone's upset with us, they won't like us. If someone don't like us, we'll be abandoned. We're going to die. It's horrible to feel that someone is angry at you. It's this horrible feeling. And we'll do anything. And so a lot of times we're that go-to person. We work late. We rescue others. We're codependent. We're people pleaser. They're just ways of acknowledging that there is something to worry about. And taking on too much responsibility doesn't solve why I'm worrying. And it's not about the work, it's about how I feel if I say no or I, let, or, or, I, or let someone else get in trouble because of their own irresponsibility. And then a lot of times preparing for the worst. We're, you know, here again, it's a catastrophe in the making. We're believing that the worst possible outcome is inevitable, so we take extreme measures to prepare and live as if imminent danger is just a moment away. Take that list home and start asking yourself, you know, we're looking at worry here where most people never stop to do this. You can go your whole life and no one's ever probably challenged you with this kind of thinking. I know it was, as I researched in that, it was new for me, good stuff for me to think about. And the question, the point is, if we don't challenge ourselves on this kind of worrying, we're just going to continue to do it. And for many of us, we don't know what it's like to live without worry. We wake up in the morning and it starts. It's a habit. It's our normal. And it's very scary to not do our normal. It can be very petrifying to bust out of our normal, especially when it comes to worry, because worry has really got us in its grip. If I don't worry, what would happen? We feel that we're really doing something we're not. We're worrying. That's why faith is so important. Faith is taking our worry and giving them to God. Faith is giving our worry to God and letting him take care of it. So what, what can we do about worrisome thinking? Let's, let's look at the, a couple of these things, bottom of page six here. One I call the triple A here, right? You know, worry happens. Temptation is to distract ourselves, but when we do, we haven't done anything with the worry. And so, you know, what are some things? First of all, when a worrisome thought comes in our mind, we need to acknowledge it. It doesn't do good to, to ignore it. I'm not asking us to say, oh, I can't think that, I can't think that. All that's going to do is perpetuate it. We need to stop and ask ourselves, what am I thinking? And acknowledge, hey, it's just a thought. Jealousy is a hard one. When you're, when you're in jealousy's grip and you're jealous, it's a hard one to overcome. We feel that it's so serious, and we automatically think that something has to be done. If I have a jealous thought, then there must be something I'm jealous about. 
There must be some truth to this, but the fact is it's a thought. And there's a lot of reasons why we can have a jealous thought. It may have nothing to do with our partner. And so we need to ask ourselves and, and say, okay, I had this thought, and acknowledge it's just a thought. Thoughts by themselves don't do anything. They don't harm. It's behavior that we need to watch. But thinking a thought is just a thought. It's what we do with that. And so I'm having a worry thought. It's just a thought. I don't have to believe it or act on it. You may want to write it down where you can laugh at it. Ha! Huh. Get out of here. Start looking at some of your worrying thoughts and start realizing these are just thoughts. Second, start to accept that this is just a false alarm. Many of these thoughts are coming from lies, beliefs that we have about ourselves and life that aren't true. And so it creates a false alarm. No different if it, than if an alarm, a fire alarm went on right now and there's no smoke or sparks or fire anywhere within two miles. The alarm is faulty. It went off. There was no reason for it. And a lot of our worry thoughts are nothing but false alarms. I don't have to listen to this. We do this with OCD behavior. One of the hardest things to work on is OCD when we have these condition, you know, obsessive thinking, you know, and I know I've had them, so I've had to work on it myself, and, and it seems so important. But when we start to realize that it's just a thought, I don't have to act on it, it's faulty, why it can set us free. And that kind of goes along uh, with the next one, and that is that we not only is it faulty alarm, it's a faulty alarm because it's faulty wiring, <laughs> wiring. Our brain has been wired wrong. We've learned something that isn't true. We're, we've wired our brain in a certain way. It's difficult to believe that something of our, some of our thinking is a false alarm. They feel so real. It helps to understand that there are false alarms because they're based on faulty logic. There are lies behind our worry that we cannot afford to believe them. It helps when we see an alarm is going off and there's something wrong causing it. It's faulty wiring. What we need to do is work on the faulty wiring, not the worry. Why am I feeling this way? Why am I believing this? What am I believing? What's the truth? That's where we're going to be going in the future here. That's what we need to do. The second thing we can do is expose those worrying thoughts, right? Once we know what they are, we expose them. You know, we get so used to our worry that it becomes a habit. And we're worrying without thinking on how or why we got there. And, and, you know, we've given you many clues now in this lesson, and you need to go back, and you can look at and start being your own detective. Just as if someone else gave you this paper and, and, and told you what they were doing, and they asked you, help me. What do you think's going on here? You need to do that for yourself. You need to be your own detective. Don't wait for someone else to do it for you. Expose those worried thoughts. Be on the lookout for them. Identify them. And then the third thing is refute them. Once you know what they are, refute them. First, you're a detective. This is like law and order, right? You're the detective. Now let's get the lawyers in here, right? And let's take it to court. You've got the culprit. <laughs> now let's prove. Let's prove that it's wrong. And you need to be your own lawyer. You need to ask the questions. You need to bring the proof. I feel this way, but is that true? Is that what those people that love me would say? Is that what God would say? Or am I just feeling this way and I've, it is a habitual thinking and I get into that because, I, and, and we have to ask ourselves, and this is the truth, what am I gaining? What am I gaining from this worry behavior? What am I gaining from believing this? Oh, I'm a loser. You know, you can gain a lot from that. Well, what could you gain from that? Well, you don't have to try anything. 
If you're a loser, you don't have to fail because you're not going to try anything. Oh, you won't have to be embarrassed because you're not going to try. I mean, you can try to protect yourself. You can get out of working hard if you give up. I mean, you know, if anger is, you know, anger is that way, right? What do you gain from anger? Oh, my goodness. You can manipulate people. You can, you know, stop from having to do anything because you got a tantrum. I mean, there is gain in our behaviors. And a lot of times I have to ask myself, when I do this particular kind of worry, what am I gaining? Because we do things we gain from. We don't sit around and waste our time. We're getting something out of it. We're either avoiding something, we're either something's going on here, and we need to ask ourselves that. So we refute it, but it doesn't do good just to refute. The next one is we need to replace it. I often tell people you don't just run from something, you run to something. And we don't want to just run from worry behavior, we want to run to something. And what would be some good substitutes, right? Faith would be the right kind of answers to the questions that need to be asked would be the truth about who we are, whether we feel it or not at that point in time. Those are the kind of things that we need to replace it with, and it may not feel natural. Worry feels natural because we've done it so long doesn't feel natural not to worry sometimes. It feels very out of place. And we need to start learning that this is what God wants us to do. It should be our natural behavior not to worry. And once we get going on it, when we start replacing that kind of behavior, look at what Paul says here in Philippians. Don't worry about anything. We're on page 7 toward the bottom. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. I mean, look at that. That's perfect. You can replace that for any worry you have. Then you will experience God's peace, which excels anything we can understand. His peace will guard what? Your hearts, right? That emotional part of you as well as your minds. As you live in Christ Jesus, and he doesn't stop there. I mean, that's enough. But he actually goes after our kind of thinking. He says, this final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true. And I used to ask myself, I've been practicing this thing for decades. And I remember in my 20s, out in the middle of a field, when I was talking about God about all this stuff, I was reading and I read this verse. And I remember and I started to think, okay, I got to ask myself what's true. You know, what's true? What's honorable? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? He says, think about these things. And I had to admit that the things I would worry about didn't fit in those categories. And I had to make a choice. And I've had to make that choice over and over and over again. Every decade brings up new things that we can worry about, new concerns. And we have to practice these things over and over again. Paul is saying to replace our worry with prayer and thanksgiving and telling God about our problems. And so that's, that's the things that we can do. On page 8, we continue. And I mentioned this one already. Think pos probability versus possibilities probability versus possibilities. And we just need to quit looking at just the endless possibilities and start saying, you know, that's nonsense. There's no end to this. This is ridiculous thinking. What's the probability of this really happening? And then the sixth is do for you what you would do for someone else. If someone else came to you with this problem, you would probably tell them not to worry. You would probably point out to them that, that that's, they don't need to think that way. You would probably be kind and compassionate toward them and, and tell them to use their faith and to think differently. Well, why don't we do it for ourselves? Why don't we do that same self-compassion for ourselves and start tempering this worry? And then we 
kind of mentioned it already, turn to God. Turn to God. And I've listed all kinds of verses for you here on page 8 and 9 that you can look at. Uh, and you can take those home and look at some of those verses and meditate on those this week. When doubt fills my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. But all who listen to me will live in peace, untroubled by fear of harm. I mean, those, there's some tremendous scriptures here that you can read and look at. And like I said, in a couple of weeks, we'll go over some mind skills where we're going to start working on how do we cause the body to stop. Because if we can get the body to stop feeling this, the brain a lot of times will follow. But go to page 10 and we'll finish here. Worry a lot of times is a symptom that there's something else maybe going on. And a lot of times we won't be able to figure this out by ourselves. Sometimes we need help. And so get the help you need. It may be counseling. It may be a good friend. It may be reading some materials. Maybe listening to some videos. But start, start learning more about this. Get the help you need. Get some of the skills that you need. Some of these things, you need problem-solving skills. And get rid of the problem where you don't have to worry. And then, of course, we talked about spiritual disciplines, spiritual disciplines. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. This is only the fourth week. We got 12, so we've got a lot more stuff. We'll go over a lot of spiritual solutions. We'll go over a lot of the body solutions. We'll go over a lot. But tonight, this is what I wanted to go. I wanted to challenge us tonight. The next week, we'll come, and we're going to learn a lot about ourselves and some of the things we're thinking, we're going to start looking more deeply at what are we thinking. So please, don't stay away. Come back. Those of you that are watching, come back next week. We're going to go over some of those. And I, I, I know that this kind of stuff will help you because God can help us with our thinking. So let's just commit this in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, that tonight we could start uh, talking about this, about the way that we think. And next week as we go into it more, Lord, I pray that... Uh, you would just help us expose some of this thinking that's going on in our minds, Lord, we, where we can, Father, learn what the truth is. And we can let go of and this anxiety and worry that just cripples us sometimes. So, Father, I thank you that you want us to know the truth. And you, you promise truth will set us free. So I pray for each one of us that this would be a process of setting us free. And as your word says, for who the Son is set free is free indeed. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to you and pray that you would do a marvelous work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.